Good morning and welcome. It's good to see each of your faces this morning on a gloomy day outside, but we can be thankful that the Lord is still good, even in dreary days. Uh, if you look on the inside of your bulletin and on the back of your bulletin, you'll see a plethora of announcements for you to keep in mind. Uh, ladies, uh, the Christmas party... Um, I've been told that Betty Beatum's been feeling a little under the weather, so there could be a change in venue, so keep your ear out for that. I'm sure the ladies will let you know where that will be held. As far as I know, it's still going to be held no matter what. Also, uh, obviously, we've got our candlelight service coming up near the end of the month on Christmas Eve. Uh, there's also going to be our regular worship time in the morning at 10 a.m., but there won't be uh, Sunday school that Sunday or the Sunday following on New Year's Eve. So those two Sundays in a row, we won't have any Sunday school. Um, as far as I'm aware, the angel trees have all been snatched up, uh, but the due date for those is Wednesday the 13th, and then uh, we're going to be delivering those on Sunday the 17th. And then on the back, um, if you have a teenager that's wanting to go to snow blast pay attention to to the two packages that are available there that you can purchase for that this morning i want to direct your attention to psalm 98 there the psalmist says oh sing to the lord a new song for he has done marvelous things his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him the lord has made known his salvation he has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. So let's pray first, and then we'll have our Advent candle lighting, and then we'll sing our praises in joy to our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we come into your place today as your people wanting to bring our praises before you and wanting to hear you speak to us through the power of your word. Even as we sing our songs to you, we recognize our songs are rooted in your word. And so in a way, we're even hearing from you as we sing. And so Lord, would you give us ears that hear your voice today, that we wouldn't harden our hearts, but would rejoice in the salvation that you've made plain to each and every one of us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh for our sake, to save us and to deliver us from our sins. We have come to bring him praises today. May they be acceptable to you. May our hearts be acceptable to you as well. We pray this in our Savior's precious name. Amen. is full of stories, fascinating, true stories that capture the imagination, brutal stories of war, revenge, and violence, tragic stories of betrayal, and endless stories of God's power, his love, and his faithfulness. And every story points to a promise. A savior is coming. Things will be put right. Don't give up. God gave Isaiah a glimpse of what to wait for. A people walking in darkness see a great light. The war is over. The victory celebration begins. is born, a son is given, a leader will finally bring peace and justice forever. And so the waiting began. We like 
the first candle of expectation to remember the promises of God, a promise of the coming Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise of your Son, our Savior. Help us to walk through this dark world with hope and expectation of the coming of your Savior once again. Amen.
you go to your prayer sheet, click the highlight in AB1 to your prayer sheet. Under long-term care facility resident, Lonnie and Linda Gilpin are in Stonebridge Memorial Care in Jacksonville. Please keep them in your prayers um, as they've been moved there. And just send anyone who wants to visit them or send a card, that'd be appreciated for them. Also, um, Aaron's asked us to pray for his family, so we'll pray for his and, and all the families here. Um, over at FBCA, we have a, a young family. They have a four-year-old boy. His name is Simeon Huber, and he has leukemia. And um, he was doing really well until, like, last week. So he got a fever, and they diagnosed him with the leukemia is really bad, and they're kind of just... You know, I'm not sure the, what the exact diagnosis is right now, but just pray for this four-year-old boy um, and that God will work a miracle and God's will will be done. So before we read, I mean, before we go to prayer, let me read Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So as we go to the Lord, let us let God examine us. Let us pray. Father God, Lord Almighty, search us, examine us, Father, and show us the things that are offensive to you. And help us, Father, to get rid of those things in our lives. Father, as we come to you in prayer today, we lift up Simeon to you and the Hubert family, each and every one of them, Father. We ask that, Father, your will be done and you be with um, this family and you be with Simeon and help. Father, if your will is to heal him, Father, we ask for you to heal him. Father, we ask for Aaron's family and every family here, Father. Everyone seems like they're going through some trials or sickness. Father, just be with each and every one of the families here and those who can't make it today also. Father, we ask for your word today to be heard and proclaimed. Father, we ask that not only will it be heard and, and proclaimed, that we will listen and we obey and seek your wisdom for our lives. And Father, just give us attentive ears and be with Jonathan as he is speaking today, Father, to speak your words. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, gentlemen. Scripture readings out of Isaiah chapter 62, verses 10 through 12. Pass through, pass through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, raise a banner for the nations. The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to the, to the daughter of Zion, see, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. They will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought after, the city no longer deserted. Children, you can go off to Children's Church. Let's pray as we open God's word. Oh Lord, we open your word today to hear from you, to hear your spirit speaking to us through those words that were written so long ago, long even before our Savior's birth. Oh Lord, open our ears to hear your voice, soften our hearts to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today marks the first Sunday of Advent, so ready or not, Christmas is coming soon. But so is our Lord Jesus Christ. Traditionally, Advent throughout the centuries of the church has actually been a season of anticipation, of looking forward. Since the early days of the church, Advent was actually been a time more focused on concentrating on the second coming of Jesus than it has been on the first coming. It's not until later on in church history that the first coming became so prominent. So even now, today, as we enter into Advent, it's a season in which we wait in earnest for Christ's return while we also wonder in awe at his first coming in a manger. As we enter the Advent season this year to celebrate the first coming of Jesus, we're going to especially be setting our gaze on the horizon, eagerly anticipating his second coming. Our theme over the next several Sundays is going to be prepare the way, That's echoing the theme of of the message of John the Baptist as he preached out in the wilderness to the people of Israel to prepare their hearts for the appearance of their Messiah on the world stage of history. We're going to structure our time this Advent somewhat loosely around John the Baptist and his ministry, which is really designed to point away from himself to Jesus Christ, to prepare the people for Jesus. And that's my hope for this Advent for each of us, that we would learn from John that Christ must increase and we must decrease, that by looking at John the Baptist, remarkably, our eyes are going to be drawn away from him and be captivated with Jesus Christ. And so I pray that this series is going to fill us with much anticipation and expectation, as well as a renewed commitment to prepare the way for the coming of our Savior in our hearts and in the hearts of other people around us in our lives. Significantly, the story of John the Baptist doesn't actually begin in the New Testament. It actually begins in the pages of the Old Testament. John's story doesn't even begin with John himself. It actually begins with the Lord giving a message to his prophet Isaiah. More than 700 years before John's or even Jesus' birth, the Lord gave Isaiah, his prophet, a message that he was to deliver to the people of Judah. In the first 39 chapters, of the book of Isaiah, the message of the prophet was actually pretty bleak if you read through it. The Lord gave Isaiah a message of a coming judgment that was going to fall upon the kingdom of Judah. In chapter 39, Isaiah actually foretold that Judah is going to be taken into exile in Babylon. And that's exactly what's going to transpire more than 100 years later in 586 BC. The Babylonians would come in, conquer the city of Jerusalem, and take away the the survivors of the kingdom of Judah into captivity in the land of Babylon. But then there comes chapters 40 through 55 of the book of Isaiah, which addresses these future exiles. It's, It's as if in these chapters, the prophet Isaiah wakes up from a very long nap as if he's been time traveled or transported into the future, 
where Judah is now languishing in captivity in Babylon. And it's during their time in exile that Judah would have felt defeated, distressed, disillusioned about God. They would think that maybe God had failed them, that God had forsaken them and forgotten about them once and for all. In anticipation of all this, more than 100 years earlier, God gives Isaiah a message that he begins in in Isaiah chapter 40. It's as if he's speaking to these future exiles a hundred years later. God told Isaiah to tell Judah, I haven't failed you, nor have I forgotten you, nor have I forsaken you. I am coming with might to deliver you and to be your shepherd. In sum, the opening verses of Isaiah 40 are really all about tidings of comfort and joy, as the men just sang. Comfort and joy to God's weary and wayward people in the wilderness of exile. Isaiah 40 is really a promise from God, not only about the end of his people's exile in Babylon, but even the end of mankind's exile away from God. So listen now to the comfort and joy that Isaiah is commanded to declare to the people of Judah a hundred years later in Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, but really I want us to concentrate on just the first five verses this morning but I'll read the first 11 verses for context. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. I don't have the luxury this morning of going down every bunny trail that I would wish to in this text this morning. There just isn't enough time for us to to look at every detail with a fine-tooth comb, but it really is a marvelous passage, even just reading it over, I think. What I really want to do this morning is just share with you two big implications that these verses provide for us. These are two things that we can't miss if we want to understand and if we want to apply what is being said here in God's Word. If you want a hint as to where I'm going in the outline, here are the the implications. Proclaim comfort with the gospel message and prepare hearts for the coming of Jesus Christ. If you pay attention to the outline, essentially the answers to your fill-in-the-blanks are right there. So the first implication of this passage is that there is a proclamation we must give. There's a proclamation we must give. I wonder if you noticed, as I was reading those 11 verses, this theme in most of the commands that are given in these verses. We're told to comfort, comfort, in verse 1. Speak tenderly, verse 2. Cry, verse 2. Cry, exclamation point, verse 6. Verse 9, lift up your voice. Again, lift it up. And then toward the end of verse 9, say. So all these commands require proclaiming, speaking, using your mouth, your tongue, to relay a message. Not only this, but did you notice that the main characters in these verses are not necessarily people, but voices? In verse 3, we meet a voice that's crying in the wilderness. In verse 6, we meet a voice speaking and telling Isaiah to cry. And then in verse 9, we meet a voice, presumably Isaiah, saying from a mountaintop, Behold your God. I'm not sure the implication could be any clearer today for us. Clearly, God wants his messengers to share tidings of comfort with his discouraged and downcast, distressed 
people. This is a commission not only for the prophet Isaiah to fulfill in his day, but for each of us as Christians today. God has given us a good news message that he wants us to speak in order to comfort his afflicted people. Comfort, it's really a charming word in the Bible. Today, the word comfort has almost become synonymous with being physically comfortable, like laying back in your easy chair watching the football game later today. But in the Bible, comfort is actually about alleviating sorrow. It's about relief from grief. It means to give emotional support or strength to someone else, usually by way of words. Sometimes in the Bible, the word comfort is actually rendered in courage. So comfort, it's all about giving courage. It's all about cheering the heart. It's all about strengthening the soul. Comfort is what these exiles in Babylon would have sorely needed. One of the biggest comforts that they do here in verse 1 is that God still claims them as his own. You hear what God calls them? My people. They may have feared that their failure had forced God to finally forsake them and give up on them. But even when Judah doesn't act like the people of God, God still claims them as his. God promised them comfort in their failure. They had turned from him, but he had not turned away from them. How exactly is God going to comfort his people through the prophet's message here? Well, if you look at verse 2, God's comfort essentially comes through the gospel. And I say the gospel because there are really three fundamental elements of the gospel found in verse 2 that Isaiah is to be speaking tenderly to Jerusalem. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Ultimately, this good news message of comfort is about peace with God, pardon from iniquities, and full payment made for the wages of a sin debt. So her warfare is ended, or her hard service is over, your translation might read. That would assure the exiles in Babylon that they're going to go back home. It would put them at ease that they finally had peace with God, and God was finally at peace with them. Their punishment has ended, and a new era of peace was about to begin for them. Secondly, her iniquity is pardoned. Their sins have been covered, atoned for, forgiven entirely by God. And third, she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, that doesn't mean that God has punished them more than they deserved, as if they've gotten double the punishment. The same word is actually used in Jeremiah to say that the punishment that God has given his people is equivalent in measure to their iniquities. So after the exile, if you go to uh, the book of Ezra, Ezra actually recognized that God has punished his people far less than what their iniquities deserve. So here in Isaiah, we see that God's justice is satisfied because the wages for their sin has now been paid in full. I'm sure the big question going on in the minds of the people of Judah would have been, how can all this possibly be? How can we have peace with God? How can we have pardon from our iniquities? How can our punishment be completely paid off? After all, consider that Judah is now in Gentile territory, far removed from the temple in Jerusalem, and therefore they couldn't offer sacrifices for the atonement of their sins. Without an atoning sacrifice, Judah would have understood that there could be no peace with God, that their sins could not be pardoned, that their sin debt would still be left unpaid, and therefore God would be unsatisfied with them. So how could this possibly be good news of comfort? How could it be true if there's no sacrifice? Well, in this same section of chapters, chapters 40 through 55, Isaiah is going to later go on to write in chapter 53 addressing this very issue. Judah's comfort, their relief from their grief, their peace with God, their pardon from sin, the payment for the wages of their sin could all be accomplished through the sacrifice of the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How could Judah have comfort? Well, Christ is going to bear their griefs and carry their sorrows away. 
How could Judah have peace with God? How could their iniquities be pardoned? How could their sin debt be paid off in full? Christ would be punished in their place. Pierced, crushed, stricken, smitten, afflicted, and wounded by God for them. God would take the full burden of his people's iniquity and he would lay it all on the back and shoulders of his dearly beloved son. Through Jesus Christ, full payment for the wages of sin is paid to pardon their sin and achieve the peace with God that they so desperately needed in their exile. This is the good news message that was designed by God to comfort his wayward people. Comfort would not come to them by something that they could do for God, but it would only come through what God is going to do for them. Isaiah was to tell Judah just how determined God was to forgive his people. Judah is assured that full atonement is provided for their sins in the future. And as we read through Isaiah, through the lens of New Testament eyes, we know that that atonement can only be provided through the sacrifice of Christ. Judah would have to look forward to that atoning sacrifice, and we look backward with eyes of faith. The same event is the same event that we all must trust in, whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And what makes the gospel such good news is that it truly does provide the richest comfort to the soul when you think about it. To those who are exiled, separated from God, the gospel comforts them that they have a way back home to experience peace with God through Jesus. To those who are feeling shame for the guilt of their sin, The gospel comforts them that God has pardoned even the most vile iniquity through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. And to those who are feeling like God has utterly forsaken them, the gospel comforts them with the good news that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus has promised his own people, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Or as we heard earlier in the scripture reading from Isaiah 62, God's people are called sought after and a city no longer deserted. Today, if you feel like God has abandoned you, then see Christ, and in Christ, see yourself as called found, not forsaken. In Christ, you have been called dear to God, not deserted by God. You are called forgiven, not forgotten. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news that we need to be heralding from the mountaintops this Advent season. Not just Advent, but every day of the year. We proclaim the comforting message of the gospel to discouraged and downcast people about peace with God, about pardon from sin, about payment for all of sin's wages, all through Jesus Christ. We remind all who trust in Christ that they're no longer exiled from God, but they have a home with God. They're now sons and daughters of the King. They're now our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we also invite all the world, as we proclaim from the mountaintops, to believe this gospel so that they too can receive God's comfort in Christ as well. Another implication that I want to point out comes in verses 3 to 5 of uh, of this text. There are preparations that we must make in anticipation for Christ's return. There are preparations we must make. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be, uh, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Ultimately, we know that this is a prophecy that's fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. All four Gospels, you can't miss this, all four Gospels quote this passage in Isaiah, connecting it to John's ministry. By his own admission in John chapter 1, John says that he is the voice crying in the wilderness. And yet there's something about this prophecy still left unfulfilled when you look at it. Namely, all mankind hasn't seen Yahweh's glory in full yet. Many have seen it at Christ's first coming. That's what the Apostle John wrote. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. When Jesus walked this earth 2,000 years ago, the glory of God was being revealed. Even at the cross, ironically, the glory of God is unveiled to see his beautiful character, his mercy, his grace, his love, and his justice, for example. But going back to Isaiah, there's something eschatological about these verses, verses 3 to 5. That is, 
there's still something we're waiting for the complete fulfillment of in the revelation of the Lord's glory. What was not completed in full at Christ's first coming will certainly be fulfilled at his second coming. And in the meantime, there still have to be voices that are crying out in the wilderness of this world. The king is coming. Let all flesh be ready to receive the king. As we look at these verses, uh, there are really three things that we can make out. There's an objective we see in verse 3. There are obstacles in verse 4. And then there is an oath that God makes in verse 5. Consider the objective in verse 3. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's a great objective. Be prepared for the Lord's arrival. But what would it look like for people to be prepared for the coming of the Lord? I think verse 4 begins to, to outline what that might look like. But even this word prepared is revealing. This verb throughout the Old Testament is commonly translated as to turn or to face, or to look at. It speaks of one changing or orienting themselves in a certain different direction than they were before. It means to direct your gaze toward a target. It can refer to you focusing your undivided attention at something, or fixing your interest on something, or having a complete trust in someone. Same root is used in Isaiah 53, verse 6, which I just quoted a minute ago to describe what we do when we all sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the same root is also used in Isaiah 45, verse 22, to describe how we can be saved from our turning, from our sin. God says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So I think that helps us understand what it might mean for us to begin to prepare the way for the Lord. The objective is that we are properly oriented toward the Lord. To be prepared means to have the eyes of our hearts fixed on Jesus Christ with faith. It means to be so captivated by Jesus that everything we do is now done in light of looking at him. We turn our back on everything else and we turn wholly and completely to him. It means that we're ready to receive him because we've been looking to him and that we love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. However, verse 4 does picture some obstacles that we're going to face in doing this. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. So Isaiah is hearing a voice here calling for this tremendous construction project with our complex infrastructure of of interstates, highways, main thoroughfares through the city. It's, It's kind of hard for us to imagine what this would all look like. Think of mountainous terrain, broad, deep valleys, great rivers, rugged, rocky ground. I imagine this is what the terrain of most of America was like before Dwight Eisenhower commissioned the construction of our country's uh, interstate system. Mountains at that time were tunneled through or flattened completely. Ginormous bridges were built over great valleys and rivers. Big bulldozers went out and leveled everything. All the civil engineering ensured that you can now drive on nice, flat, fast roads. Unless you're in Illinois, you still have potholes. (laughs) Could be that maybe Isaiah here is picturing a processional route. Think of the royal events today that we see on TV. The extensive preparation that goes into receiving a, a, a noted monarch. Roads are scrupulously swept. Beautiful banners are hung on buildings and light posts. Barriers are erected to to keep the way clear for the royal carriage to parade all the streets. In ancient times, conquering kings would gain access to newly acquired territories through uh, these highway systems that their own troops would build as they conquered town after town. Or when a king intended to grace the territories that are already a part of his kingdom with his royal presence... He might send out envoys and messengers to travel on ahead. They would go first to build a highway that would allow immediate access to that desired location. They would chop down trees. They would bulldoze hills. They would fill in valleys with dirt. They'd construct bridges over waterways. They'd level and straighten the king's path so that he could arrive safely and smoothly. Then they would also arrive ahead of the king, and they would shout throughout the city, announcing to the people that their king was near so that these people 
could be ready to receive the king. Here in Isaiah, the cry goes out to prepare the route for the ultimate king, God himself, coming with might to rule, verse 10 says. For Judah in exile, this, I think, would have been extremely good news to hear. God is coming to rescue them, and he's going to replace Babylon and rule over them. Isaiah is calling Judah to prepare the way for the Lord's coming on that day. Judah surely would have understood that this is not literally reshaping the landscape of the wilderness around them. Judah would have understood this to be a, really a call to spiritual construction and landscaping in their hearts. They needed to become spiritual engineers of their own hearts and the hearts of others around them. When viewed in this light, I think John the Baptist's ministry now makes some sense. We know that this spiritual landscaping has much to do with repentance. In Luke's gospel, Luke records John's ministry this way. He went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then he immediately connects that ministry with this quotation in Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So the challenge for Isaiah's and for John the Baptist's audiences, and even everyone today who hears these words, is to prepare their hearts to meet the Lord face to face, prepare for his arrival. What preparation needs to be done to provide Jesus unhindered access into your own heart? Are there deep and dark valleys of habitual sin that need to be filled in with Christ's righteousness? Are there high places of idolatry in your heart that need to be torn down and demolished? Are there mountains of pride in your heart that need to be brought low with gospel humility? Is there uneven ground of complaining or grumbling going on in your heart that needs to be leveled with thanksgiving and praise? Are there rough places of bitterness toward another that need the bulldozer of forgiveness. What do you need to do today to be prepared for the coming of the Lord? This preparation, it's not going to be easy work, but it is necessary work. And if if your face is really oriented rightly and you are turned holy to the Lord, prepared for his coming, you have his grace, you have his power working in you to accomplish all of this, to level all of these obstacles. Lastly, consider the oath that the Lord makes in verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So God is swearing here to reveal his glory to all people. In other words, Christ is returning, and the whole earth is going to be filled with his glory. That's not speculation. That's not a wishy-washy hope. That's certainty. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. In other words, rest assured that this will happen. God will display the beauty of his presence in Jesus Christ as the true answer to all of our deepest longings and desires. To welcome him properly, he requires us to radically restructure our lives. But that restructure is really going to be worth the upheaval when he comes. All the obstacles that we'll have to remove or bridge or level completely are going to all seem so trivial when our king finally comes. We will know that he is worth it and that it was worth it. This prophetic message about preparing the way for the coming of the Lord had a a, really a major impact, we know, on John the Baptist. He not only saw the need to prepare himself for the day of the Lord's coming, but also the need to dedicate himself to preparing others by calling them to repentance. That's what Advent really reminds us to do as we anticipate the coming of our King. We prepare ourselves and we call others to be ready to receive the radiant returning King. The Lord's Supper is all about celebration, preparation, and anticipation. At the table, we look back and we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We also commemorate his death on the cross. The bread and the cup, they remind us of the comfort that we have in the gospel. Through the giving of his body and the shedding of his blood on the cross, Jesus has secured for us peace with God and pardon for all our iniquities, fully satisfying the holiness and the justice of God of God in his death. The table also gives us a special occasion to prepare our hearts, to turn to the Lord in faith and repentance. We're warned by the Apostle Paul not to partake of this meal in an unworthy manner and to therefore examine ourselves and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so this is a time for us to consider our ways, 
and if necessary, to commit ourselves to correcting them and confessing sin to the Lord. We have the perfect opportunity right now to fill every valley, to bring low every mountain and hill, to smooth out the uneven places, and to level the rough terrain of each of our hearts. And finally, this table directs our gaze forward in anticipation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is going to be a glorious meal in the future for Christ and his bride, the church, who has readied herself for that great and awesome day. Listen to these words from Revelation as we prepare to come to the table with hearts of anticipation for this awesome day. Then I heard, this is John speaking, what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready, made herself prepared. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God this time I'm going to call those men who are going to be serving the communion trays to come forward. As we prepare to pass these out, just a reminder that there is a stack of cups here. The bottom cup has the bread, top cup has the juice, we're going to pass them all out at once, and we're also going to partake of them all at once together. In the meantime, the worship team is going to to lead us in song. You can feel free to join if you want, or just use it as a time of reflection or confession if your heart leads you to do that. Before we do that, let me pray. Our Lord Jesus, we are humbled to be accepted at your table. Oh, Lord, we are weak and weary sinners. We are your servants, and we recognize that we can only do what you require of us. And so many times we fall short of even doing what you've required of us. So for those instances where we've fallen short, where we've sinned and we've turned away, give us grace to turn back to you, to receive your forgiveness in full at the cross where your blood was poured out to cover us, to atone for all of our iniquities, to pay the debt that we owed but could never pay, to give us grace that we so desperately need. We rejoice in that grace. We look forward to the day where we can partake of this meal in your presence. But until then, prepare our hearts, O Lord, with repentance and with faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, saying to his disciples, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Again, we do have a time of fellowship downstairs. We would like for you to join us for that, and we can uh, share friendship and and food together. I want to end with an exhortation from the book of Romans. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone The day is at hand. Our King is coming soon. Let's prepare him room. Amen and amen. Go in the name of our King.